while one front of this battle was forced by Angela. The other front... Well, let's go for that, shall we? While Angela and the General Works team were defending the lights from Carmen, the one encouraging the distortion, if not the ultimate cause of it, her release of all of those killed within the library turned out to not be so discriminating, as Roland would realise, in the form of elite who was farther distorted and also confused by her coming back to life, remembering being killed and turned into a book as she emerged as a winged, geared, tripodal being. Then a six-armed Oswald, two of them clawed, was excited about the possibility of the encore. Then a snake-limbed Bremen, who had become a hydra-like being, made noises that might be saying, Let's get some payback! What about you, Argalia? Didn't you say something about that? Argalia appeared as a distortion. His head turned into a swirly cloud. His outfit turned into a jumpsuit and his blue light was where his face used to be. Apparently, according to him, this was the outcome of Roland's choice, as in sparing Angela. He seems to know more than Roland was saying, or indeed he was saying as well. He thanks Angela and Roland, as they can perform once again with the new forms they gave them. Jae Hyom examined his stitched up form, and Greta, with her body having many more mouths on her, couldn't wait to get back into the city. She wanted to meet people. Um, you mean, eat them? And she wanted to make the best taste that the city has ever known. Yeah, I bet you do. Roland made it clear that the choice wasn't made for their sake. She just chose what she actually wanted for the first time. Then coming back to life was more a byproduct of that choice. If Angela could be selective... She'd make sure that the scumbags and psychotics stay dead. Yeah, that includes the Reverberation Ensemble, the Syndicates, Corrupt Fixers, Cannibals. Then she'd leave the rest to come back to life, but sadly, she can't. Then a more... Demonic-looking Pluto noted that Roland appeared to be invigorated, more so than the last time he saw him, much as they were brimming with a similar vigour, a noble power seeping into his body. They shall achieve perfection with that light. Seriously call that perfection? Looking like something that a certain blood knife would... Rip apart or sheet to death? Elena wasn't as half and half as she used to be and looked more vampiric and made of blood than she previously did. She felt naked, yet able to be herself. A moment that she's been waiting for. She was born for that moment. Eileen felt a warm echo, and unlike any that she's heard, it pervaded her, a sound much closer to her heart, the motion of the city. 
the light that motivated her to not miss that final opportunity given to her. Tanya more closely resembled Anubis and wanted to go another round with her strength. Roland was not going to let any of them lay a finger on Angela. If they wanted to, they were going to have to get through him and the other librarians. Philip saw that they had reached the pinnacle, that they could go anywhere they want from there. While looking like a cross between Sammy Wolf and Ghost Rider, Arcadia mocked Roland by saying that if only he could have protected Angelica with that same resolution. Agalia, he was too far away to save her. You can talk to Olivia about that. Oh wait, never mind. It'll probably be a while before he reappears. Regardless, Roland was unconcerned with this. He focused on the task at hand. And that was kicking Argalia's Argalia see that he's accepted it in his own way. Well, Roland definitely didn't accept it Argalia's way. Argalia told him that, that in the warmth of the light they'd dance together, which would be beautiful and perduring. He called his ensemble to attention all to claim the final fraction of the light that would make them whole. Would Roland allow him to conduct this finale? As far as Roland was concerned, and indeed me, he might be distorted, but he's lost nothing. He's still as barking as ever. This is a rematch against the Reverberation Ensemble, while last time it was a desperate struggle to prevent them from claiming the light for the sole benefit of Angela. Well, we know how that worked, don't we? This time it was for more selfless reasons, to prevent them from becoming even more powerful than they already are and unleashing their twisted desires on the city, causing more pain and suffering than the head ever could on others. While the Reverberation Ensemble are as close to pure evil as it's possible to be in that world, the librarians have become as close to pure good as it's possible to be in that world where for the first time in, well, quite some time, they could dare to believe that they're the good guys in this. Yeah, even Bynar. What have we come to? As for the stage, it's a mix of instruments made from human remains, gears, meat, wax, and multicolored lights. All that which accommodates the tastes of those within that lair. This time around, the entire Asia lair is fought. Yeah, that's Philip, Eileen, Greta, and Bremen, all at once and each follow similar rules to their last battle. But Philip can share his burn immunity to the others as long as he's around. But thankfully doesn't summon cherubs. The same applies to Eileen with her smoke immunity, and damage buffing with the smoke each gain. Greta provides protection against HP and stagger damage to all while she's alive. And Bremen gives one of the others a 
the random positive benefit as long as they're around, along with a huge boost to all when they are killed. So, whichever of the patron librarians is assigned to fight this group needs to understand that Bremen needs to be defeated last. As for how the quip-off of the Tree of Death behaves on this level, Philip wants the end for everyone to be happy. He hopes that none would experience the same pain that he did, where there's no desire to own or the pain of loss. He sees nothing there but a fertile being who has everything. But they'll all create the world as they desire it. <laughs> More like a sterile being that is still running away from his pain, denying that he even exists. Well, if that isn't a sterile being, I'd like to know what is. As for Eileen, or Eileen, or how we want to call her, she sees human nature as unable to save themselves directly. Well, she's not entirely wrong about that. She sees individual force and enlightenment as wasteful. So did the Communist Party in the USSR. Look what happened to that! She saw that the flow that she sees is leading to happiness. Are you sure it's not confused for blissful ignorance? Because if that's the case, no thanks. She sees relief as only achieved by devotion, to become gears, seeing that trying to escape the flow as leading to misery. Like many religious zealots, they prefer to believe something than to... Well, rather than to take responsibility for their own actions. That's not something new. Greta wants a world full of various materials. Her hunger overpowering. She wanted to feast on her opponents, desiring the finest ingredients. Please, drop. <laughs> she was smelling a fishy smell. Okay, now that's because you've turned into something that King Shark would probably want to go out on a date with. She grows impatient, and her mouth was snappy. Um, which mouth? You've got a load of them all over your body. She wants food that she's never tasted before. Asking if the others want to try it. Well, I see that she's still the happy cannibal she was when we first saw her. As for Bremen, they made animal noises and was not so understandable but was likely talking about a musical performance and seeing the librarians as music critics. Now for the Briar layer, which is where the more powerful versions of Oswald, Tanya and Jaehyun are fought, where Oswald and Jaehyun collaborate to create Miss Bunny a stitched-up abomination with a bunny head, although Miss Mermaid and Mr. Knife appear again. He attacks the minds of each library in each scene and focuses on the one with the weakest mental defences. But stagger damage is a double-edged sword here as he gets a strong hit to that when any ally is killed. And when he's dead, the librarians are fully healed of stagger 
and any status ailments they have becomes half as bad. He can be just as dangerous to his allies as he can be to his enemies, considering that. As for Tanya, she causes damage to all librarians each scene, much as Oswald attacks the mind. And that's before she attacks. If she's killed, the librarians become stronger for the rest of the fight. If all other members of the Reverberation Ensemble are killed, this lone wolf becomes stronger and harder to damage, while also being able to attack more. Yeah, that's how she operates best. As for Ji Hyun, he can slow down a random librarian and can apply poppet strings to prevent allies from dying, but this can be negated. But killing all those with the strings can summon Mix Bunny upon dying. Hail the rabbit! All the librarians become stronger for the rest of the fight and become faster as well upon his death. The librarians understood that Tanya should not be left for last, as they know that she's a lone wolf. As for the one safe for last, that depended on how well they fought but they understood that under no circumstances should Tanya be safe for last. The stage on this layer is a mix of a bunch of stitched up pillars full of corpses and the animals of the eight o'clock circus. Although in this case, they're mostly for show. As for how the quip-off of the Tree of Death behaves on this layer, Oswald desired an even more horrific performance. How the can you make it even worse than it already is? Don't answer that. As Ji Hyun assisted Oswald in creating a bipedal, two-headed bunny member of the Eight O'Clock Circus, he wanted a big applause to all that made that stage shine, seeing that it's no time to be confused as flowers don't wait for the rain. He could see that everyone in the ensemble there had a, a sour smell, which he saw as good as his nose was numb, not wanting the curtain of the stinky performance to fall on its own. He wanted a world full of laughter-filled spider friends. <sighs> well, this isn't Undertale, and where you're going, you'll not get an audience that you'd like. Tanya saw the nature of humans as cruel and ugly. Okay, that would be difficult to argue. Unfortunately, you're not human anymore. She asked why they should be ashamed of that, to expose that. Well, it's because, unlike you, they have self-restraint. Seeing as she's dressed up beautifully and with care, weighing the value of a scale, that scale being gloomy and dirty, Usually, people are vaguely disguised. She saw it as better to be imposing from the start, to not lie to yourself. Seeing that, they like to keep things simple, honest as well. Hmm. She's likely referring to the other two rather than the librarian says, well, they're still human. Jae Hyun was impatient and refreshed. 
wanting to unravel the threads that tie humans. To give everyone true freedom, asking if they want to cut the thread. That is manipulating, urging them to change their minds, offering the librarians help. Okay, Jacon, why would they accept the offer from a deranged man spider that has gone way beyond simple vengeance? Finally, we have the Atsaluf Lair, which consists of Elena, Pluto, and Argania. The stage is largely blue, with bindings holding up a blooded figure resembling one of Elena's handiwork. There is also a reflective floor. Speaking of which, Elena is able to attack more as the fight progresses, and can also recover HP damage upon hitting a librarian as before, and can even become stronger if she hits them enough. So she's a decent candidate for the librarians to take out first. Pluto uses his contracts to cause problems for the librarians and can summon a shade, just as before. Either of the patron librarian sent to attack them, or one of the others. The shade is able to use whatever it's based on. As for Galia, he has become more powerful than he was before. When he was, well, Barely human. He also has to be defeated last, as he wouldn't be able to be killed unless the other two are dead. That, and he can attack more of each one that is dead. He can also make his ally stronger and harder to damage every few scenes. It's unlikely that this there can be defeated using one floor by itself, but it's certainly possible, even considering his strong mass attack and the power of resonance. As for how the quip-off of the Tree of Death behaves on this layer, Elena pitied those fighting to protect the frame that locks them within wanting them to be in their true form, seeing joy in being unrestrained, although unsure if this was what she truly wanted, as it's a temptation to bind more... Well, she understood that only the, reverber the reverberation ensemble can move on. It seems that she's not sure of what she wants, as her blood first wasn't remedied. Pluto was sure that they and the library could have come together if they had the same idea, regretting that they didn't, even though they tried to persuade them. Seeing his illusion as sin that he's guilty of and punished by death, the chain of those sins within the frame still trampling this, asking if there is an end to this, asking them to help him get out of the physical corruption. Sorry, Pluto, they don't have a martyr complex. They also don't want to corrupt their bodies and lose themselves. As for Argalia... He asked if they could feel the vibration, a beautiful beginning rhythm, the sheath music that was being completed, one that was to be played eternally, even if the end was visible, asking if they remembered the first sound of that eternal performance. They'll play variations that will continue to pursue new things. What does that mean? making more distortions in all their horror, making the librarian shine beautifully. 
as their performance ends and the reverberation ensembles begins. Saying goodbye to Angelica, apparently sorry until that point. Hoping that the others can keep up. Oh, they'll keep up all right. As long as there's still some of them still standing, they will make sure that you don't succeed. Just as the librarians thought that Argalia was truly defeated, he overwhelmed them and tried to charge up a sphere of energy. And then Roland intervened after pulling Angela out of the lights at the last minute, much to her confusion. Roland found it good to see her after she was within the light for a She returned to her mechanical body as her face was pale again. Saying this as he fought the distorted Argalia, Angela asked Roland what he did. Well, she almost evaporated within the light on the last day, so he pulled her out of the pillar of light. Then he told her that he needed to focus on that persistent sicko. Angela didn't think that he should have done what he did, as she wouldn't be able to revert everything completely this way. Argalia, at that point, believed it all to be for naught. It was his one last chance, silently cursing the two that stood in his way. This distraction was all Roland needed. He thrust Durandal into the distortion, telling him that he should have behaved like the lunatic that he always was until the very end. Perhaps referring to how unpredictable he'd be in combat with such a chaotic mindset. It was punishment for going out of character and squealing like an amateur. Argalia saw this as hideous. Although not his physical appearance, it was his indignant and inelegant end. He told Roland, his brother-in-law, that he'll send his sister Roland's regards. Roland told him to drop dead already. Hmm, by his standards, that's actually quite polite given the circumstances. As, given the circumstances, you'd expect him to say something like, eat and die, after all that's happened. After killing Argalia, who, like the others of his ensemble, are staying dead, Roland sees it as wrapped up, asking what Angela was going to do now. Angela was at a loss. Roland again stated that she was an android again. Well, it was good while it lasted, as she was able to forget her past while she was human. Roland asked about the people turned into books. The ones in the library. Were they coming back? Although the only ones that came back so far were the distorted reverberation ensemble. Angela told him that they'd wake up to find themselves lying somewhere in the city, feeling like they've overslept. But Roland added that there's a little uncertainty, which she confirmed as she's unable to know. when or where they will appear and wake up. Roland understood that it didn't affect things that much as, well, it would work out in the end. Angela asked why he pulled her out of the light if he wasn't certain. Well, 
Roland wanted to do something for himself. He didn't want to work out the cost and benefits side of it. Angela saw that he was still hiding something. Roland told her that Yuri, the purple tear, told him one thing before he arrived there. When you get there, it'll be nice in several ways to do what you want without letting anything hold you back at the end, kit. Roland understood what she meant. At the moment, he saw Angela slowly vanish into the light. But it meant that he could pull her out at the last minute. Angela understood that it sounds like, well, Yuri anticipated everything. Well, enough to consider possibilities. It's why she went into the library, knowing that she'll be killed with the possibility that she'll come back. Angela also saw that the purple tear was how Roland entered the library. Roland reminded her of Iori's ability to jump between dimensions, that she could read in her book. Roland was doubtful that it would do anything for him, but she was willing to help him, which would also help her. So he accepted her deal. He then picked up Angela's list of wishes and gave it back to her. Angela admitted that half of them were not possible in her current body. Well, it's likely that one of them, at least, involves a digestive system and taste buds. Roland understood that they'd have to start figuring that out from that point onwards. But there's no one single answer to that. There are many people interconnected, all with different stories, different answers. Hmm. Now that would be the perfect place to end the story, wouldn't it? Unfortunately, it's not the end. There's just one part of this story to go through before we conclude it. I did mention that I'd theorised why Ian acted the way that he did towards Angela, and why there was no failsafe to stop her from cutting out the light the first time. Theories will be spoken of, and the final chapter of this story shall be concluded. Until next time. Hail the rabbits!